Well, thank you very much, Andrew. I hope you like the title, Brands and CEOs. Everyone here is interested in brands and love them or hate them, you can't ignore CEOs. Most of you work in marketing. I won't say uh, much about functional marketing, advertising, promotion and so on, but I will talk about the role of marketing, especially in driving the marketing concept. We also have IP lawyers here today, and I'll touch on brands as IP, something I'm familiar with uh, as an expert witness. I'll start by laying out the ground, uh, defining a few terms and introducing the key ideas like brand equity and the marketing concept. I'll then talk about how brands and marketing relate to the three dimensions of the CEO's world, strategy and execution, finance and organisation. Finally, I'll give you some suggestions that may be helpful when you get back to your day jobs. As so often, there's a relevant uh, quote from Jeremy uh, Bullmore. This is from the second Brands Lecture in 2001. When CEOs try to think about brands, their brains hurt. So the first thing we need to do is to be crystal clear about what we mean by brands and why they matter. There are three valid but categorically different definitions of brand in a business context. The first is easy. If I ask you which brand you bought, the answer will be a specific named product or service, such as a can of Coke. The second is also pretty obvious. It's the brand name and other intellectual property. The key underlying issue, though, is the third meaning of brand, brand equity. It's brand equity that makes CEOs brains hurt. If Coke has a new product that looks or tastes different from Coca-Cola, the question may be about which trademark to use, but the answer will depend on the fit between the new product and the existing brand equity. A bare trademark with no associated brand equity has little, if any, value. So this lecture is really about brand equity and CEOs. And if you can be crystal clear about the distinctions between these three meanings of brand, you may be able to reduce your CEO's headache. My definition of brand equity is the customer's and some others awareness of and beliefs, feelings, associations and expectations about products and services sold under a particular trademark and the company that supplies them. It resides in long-term semantic memory and can be sort of measured today. The reason why it matters is that it influences future brand choice and willingness to pay for the same and other products sold under the same trademark and or by the same company. Brands create customer value because they simplify purchasing, incentivize companies to keep investing in quality and innovation, and sometimes add emotional value in their own right. The fact that brand equity today influences customer purchases in the future is why it's a valuable asset. Despite the brain pain, CEOs and CFOs sort of get this, even if they're unsure about exactly what it means and the practical implications. One piece of evidence that CEOs understand the value of brand equity is that other things being equal, executive remuneration is lower in companies with strong brands. The study behind this was published late last year by my colleagues Nada Tavasoli and Rajesh Chandi with Alina Sarescu at Texas A&M University. It doesn't mean that executives have a financial incentive to reduce brand equity. It does mean that to attract and retain executives, firms with strong brands don't have to pay as much as firms with weak brands because people identify with the company and its brands and because working on a strong brand is generally better for their future career prospects. The effect is biggest for CEOs who identify most strongly with the brand, but also stronger for younger top managers with less clearly defined identities and more of their careers ahead of them. There's a wider lesson here about the value of employee-based brand equity, a big and under-researched topic in its own right. Meanwhile, these results are tangible evidence that CEOs do understand the value of brand equity. How is customer-based brand equity created? 
the main mechanism is customers' own and trusted others' previous experience of buying and using products and services sold under the same brand name by the same company. The most trusted others are close family, friends and colleagues, plus some other trusted th third parties, including which. Other sources include social media and sites like TripAdvisor, although these are usually seen as a bit less trustworthy. Brand equity can be reinforced by brand communications, but customer experience is usually much more important. The challenge for marketers is that most of the people who determine the quality of customer experience don't report to marketing, especially in service businesses. Building brand equity is therefore mostly about marketers' ability to engage and influence the rest of the company, supplemented by the activities they themselves control. However, the balance varies a lot between categories and even brands. Consider Grey Goose versus Accenture. Grey Goose comprises ethanol, C2H5OH, a commodity, water, H2O, another commodity, trade, marketing and distribution, not a commodity, but quite close to one for firms with the right resources, and branding. Grey Goose's brilliant branding and the resulting brand equity is its main asset and the reason why Bacardi paid $2.2 billion for it in 2004, just eight years after Sidney Franck created it out of thin air. When Anderson Consulting split from Arthur Anderson, it agreed to stop using the Anderson brand name. Its brand equity had been built over time by both companies. Unlike Grey Goose, brand communications had had only a minor sporting role. In rebranding, it aimed to retain this brand equity and refresh it a bit. As usual, the new name was initially much mocked, especially the accent over the T. But when Arthur Anderson got into trouble over Enron in 2002, Accenture dodged a nasty bullet. In line with these differences in what creates brand equity, marketing has a fairly minor supporting role in professional services, but a dominant role for some consumer product brands. What do Grey Goose and Accenture and most companies have in common? It's that brand equity accounts for a significant proportion of company value, higher for Grey Goose, but significant for both. So the CEO and CFO should be interested provided we can tackle their confusions and concerns. We also need to clarify the two definitions of marketing. One definition of physics is it's what physicists do, and the equivalent is also true of marketing. One thing marketers definitely do is spend the marketing budget. That defines what they directly control, functional marketing activities like market research, advertising and promotion. But marketers also help implement the marketing concept, the idea that, in the long term, firms succeed by profitably, keyword, profitably, meeting customers' needs better than the competition. It's now over 60 years since Peter Drucker first proposed the marketing concept. Every CEO can recite it, possibly even word for word, but as, I, as I'll discuss later, it's proved much easier to say than to do. It's about maximising the overlap between the customer's needs and the company's needs, especially as seen by the CEO. If you ask marketers about their customers' top three needs, they should be able to give you a clear answer with little effort. If they can't, you have a big problem. But if you ask them what are the CEO's top three issues, most marketers will struggle. One message I'd like you to take from this lecture is that increasing marketers' understanding of what matters most to the CEO is almost bound to be helpful in setting marketing priorities. It may also help uh, address marketing's declining influence. The evidence uh, on this uh, is limited but pretty consistent. I'm going to give you some from a recent German study which found clear evidence of a decline in marketing's influence since the 1990s. Interestingly, at least in Germany, the only function whose influence had increased was sales, not finance. The influence of finance operations and R&D 
had stayed pretty constant. The good news for marketers was that an influential marketing department contributed more to company performance than for any of the other four departments. So what do CEOs spend their time on? The answer is lots of things across three different dimensions. Their strategy, essentially marketing strategy, what are we planning to sell to whom and how, and execution, is it happening as we planned? There's finance, both investment and performance. In both cases, it's about expected or actual revenues versus costs. And there's organization. Almost every CEO wants the company to become more customer focused, innovative and agile, while del delivering reliably and continuously reducing costs. Across all three dimensions, board discussions are a mixture of ex ante and ex post, although they don't use those terms. Strategy, investment, and innovation are mainly ex ante. Execution, <clears throat> financial performance, and delivery are mostly ex post. One reason why finance is easier but less interesting than marketing is that everything it does is either ex post or uses other people's ex ante numbers. And if these turn out to be wrong, it's the other people's fault. Despite the importance of meeting the customer's needs, strategy and execution are obviously also about meeting customers' needs. Simply Better is a book I wrote about this with Sean Meehan, the first non-US book to win the American Marketing Association's annual book prize. Partly based on Andrew Ehrenberg's research on patterns of brand choice, it challenged conventional wisdom by arguing that marketers' obsession with differentiating the brand from the competition can distract companies from focusing on customer needs. In reality, customers rarely buy a brand or service because it offers something unique. Instead, they usually buy the brand uh, they expect, by which I mean the first meaning of brand, a name, product or service. They buy the brand that they expect to meet their basic needs from the category a bit better or more conveniently than the competition. In other words, what customers want is simply better, not more differentiated products and services. Let me illustrate. This is a textbook, well-differentiated brand. Everyone knows that Volvo cars are safe. If I asked a conference of dentists in Sydney, what do you associate with Volvo, they'd all mention safety. Of course, Volvo has lots of other brand associations, but the attribute it owns is safety. That's worth something, and Volvo is a valuable brand. But this is a much more valuable brand, despite being less well differentiated. Of course, we know that Toyota is reliable and Japanese, but so is Honda. And despite the slogan, Toyota isn't an emotive brand. Janis Joplin didn't sing, Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Toyota? But even after a few setbacks in recent years, it remains the most valuable car brand on the planet. These are from Brand Finance's list of the top 500 brands in the world. Toyota was the top car brand, Volvo was number 19. I see we've got uh, David Haig sitting in the front row, so uh, I better behave myself. I'll come back to Toyota uh, a bit later, uh, and also brand valuation, uh, but for now it's clear that it's uh, although Toyota's less well differentiated than Volvo, uh, it is much more valuable. This comes back to what matters to customers. As marketers, we tend to focus on what differentiates our brand from the competition, its unique features and benefits, and its branding and brand communications, because that's what we control. We're tempted to see the category benefits as mere table stakes or hygiene factors, not a source of differentiation. And anyway, a problem for operations people less creative and interesting than us. But that's not how customers see things. What matters most to them is getting the category basics reliably and with as little effort as possible. Sports sponsorship can be tricky. Perhaps the person you're sponsoring fails to perform, or perhaps they succeed but turn out to have been doing drugs or cheating on their spouse, or they're a horrible person in interviews. I'm not naming any names. <laughs> B&Q sponsored Ellen MacArthur. Ellen passed all the tests. She was a very good sailor. 
she broke the world record for the fastest solo circumnavigation of the globe. She had excellent values and everybody loved her. And the boat was called B&Q, so the brand association was really strong. Ellen's triumphant return achieved ecstatic media coverage. Sports sponsorship doesn't get much better than this. The next day, B&Q received this letter. Now, if B&Q had delivered Mr. Roberts' kitchen on time, he would have been proud and delighted to be associated with Ellen's triumph, told all his friends and family about it, and so on. But he wasn't prepared to trade off the frustration of not having his kitchen against the warm glow generated by B&Q's successful sponsorship. The idea that the basics are just commodity table stakes is dangerous nonsense. This is from a McKinsey study in 2004. By that point, mobile was a maturing market, but the worst carrier received 5.7 times as many complaints per million subscribers as the best. This isn't a 20 or 30% difference, it's a huge difference. And if people took the trouble to complain to a better business bureau, they were pretty darned angry and quite likely to tell a lot of other people too. One company that totally gets simply better is Apple, now the most valuable company in the world, with $46 billion free cash flow last year. This is a quote from their chief designer, Jonathan Ive, a Brit. Our goals are very simple, to design and make better products. If we can't make something that's better, we won't do it. Most of our competitors are interested in doing something different or want to appear new. I think those are completely the wrong goals. It's not about price or a bizarre marketing goal to appear different. These are corporate goals with scant regard for people who use the product. Note that he singles out marketers for distracting companies from focusing on what matters to customers. I said I'd come back to Toyota. This is about another McKinsey study that shows why it's such a valuable brand despite, despite its lack of clear brand differentiation. Now, in a rare moment of good sense, old General Motors set up a plant on a greenfield site in California as a joint venture with Toyota, the world's best manufacturer. At the time of the study, the plant made just one type of car, a compact, sold as either a Toyota Corolla or a Chevy Prism. GM was spending 750 bucks per car more on promotion than Toyota, but the Toyota was outselling the Prism by four to one and keeping its price premium in the second-hand market. The brand was the only difference between the two products. Why was and is Toyota a stronger brand than Chevrolet, even in Chevy's home market of the USA? Well, in this case, I don't have any data, but my hunch is that over many years, Customers have found that Toyota makes reliable cars that get you from A to B in good comfort at reasonable cost and with generally good after-sales service. Their experience with Chevy have been more mixed. In other words, Toyota's been simply better at providing what most, not all, car buyers want, the basics. Crucially, customers remember this and tell each other, and that's brand equity. Of course, the basics aren't everything. Functional marketing is always important, and in cases like Grey Goose, the main driver of company value. Because of digital, social and mobile, data analytics and all that, functional marketing has never been so complex, fast-changing and interesting. But for most companies, it's the rest of the triangle that matters most to customers and therefore to long-term value creation and the CEO. Let's look at the second dimension of the CEO's world, finance. Ideally, we'd evaluate business and marketing performance by measuring short-term performance and adding the increase or subtracting the decrease in brand value. This would give a holistic picture and discourage short-termism. The trouble is that for fundamental reasons, brand valuation isn't reliable enough to enable us to do this. 
In the late 80s, companies started putting brand valuations into their balance sheets using a range of methods and assumptions. The Institute of Chartered Accountants asked LBS to study what was happening and say if we thought it was okay. Our short answer was no, because brand equity isn't tradable and doesn't have a market price, and even the most rigorous methodology, assigning a, val a value, even with the most rigorous t methodology, assigning a financial value to it involves subjective judgments, as I'll explain shortly. The slightly longer answer is that it depends on what you think the balance sheet is for, which turned out to be a contested and, by accounting standards, highly emotive issue. The third answer is it doesn't matter because grown-up investors know that the balance sheet says almost nothing about the economic value of the business, so they largely ignore it. This arcane UK debate 25 years ago had some good consequences. It forced some of us to become much clearer about the nature of brands and London became and remains the leading global centre of expertise on brand valuation. And also, and not just in the UK, I think it did contribute to the growing awareness among CEOs and CFOs of the importance of brands. So what's the problem? Here are the latest top car brand valuations from the three main valuation companies. There's a clear correlation between them. Across all categories, not just cars, it's about 0.7. At the same time, there are many differences. The biggest here is for VW, and not just because of the emissions test scandal, which didn't happen till September, after the brand finance and brands valuations, but before the interbrand one. In fact, interbrand's October 2015 valuation of 12.5 billion was down only 9% year on year. So the scandal accounts for hardly any of the difference between it and Brand Finance's 31 billion valuation in February. Brands with a Z didn't even have VW among its top 100 global brands. All we know is that its valuation would be less than 11 billion, the estimate for Scotiabank ranked at 100. Finally, the bottom row shows the number of car brands in each valuation company's top 100 brands. Here it's Interbrand that's the outlier. None of this is a criticism of the valuation companies. Of course they use slightly different approaches, but even if they didn't, their estimates would vary because brand valuation inherently involves judgment. This brings me back to what would be involved in trying to use it to supplement the short-term financials in assessing marketing performance. To use brand value as a metric, we'd need estimates of it before and after the period we want to evaluate. For the brand value at time T1, we'd first estimate the proportion of the company's profit or cash flow attributable to the brand. That is, how much lower the profit or cash flow would be if the company didn't own the trademark. In this case, it either wouldn't benefit from the brand equity associated with the trademark, which raises the question of what it would do instead, or it would have to pay someone else a royalty to use the trademark and benefit from the brand equity. Step two is to turn this incremental profit or cash flow into a valuation at time T1. Suppose we're working with profit, not cash flow. In that case, step two involves multiplying the profit attributable to the brand by a number that in principle reflects four things at time T1. The strength of the brand, the expected future growth of the category, the expected level of future competition, and how the financial markets are currently valuing the earnings of comparable businesses reflected in the PE ratio for the industry. We'd then go through the same steps at time T2, and the increase in brand value is the difference between the two estimates. It should be clear uh, that all this involves a lot of informed judgment. Some reasons why BV2 differs from BV1 may have nothing to do with changes in the strength of the brand. For instance, industry PE ratios might have fallen or a new competitor appeared unexpectedly. The bottom line is that changes in brand valuations aren't a good measure of marketing performance, except perhaps over long time periods like at least 10 or so years. So what can you do? First, the process of brand valuation can have value as a discipline and a source of learning, 
provided you don't take the single number that emerges as some kind of absolute truth. Secondly, make sure that you and all your team all understand basic finance and accounting, enough to be on top of the key concepts and to be able to read and interpret the numbers. If you stick to the basics, it really isn't that difficult, and in my view, it's much more interesting than most marketers think. And it's really important. Finance is the universal language of business, and financial numbers loom large in the minds of CEOs and other top managers. There are lots of good courses on finance for non-financial managers. Just do it. This is a really easy win. Thirdly, develop a set of metrics for brand equity and all marketing activities. Not too many. Unsophisticated companies operate with financial numbers and no marketing metrics. Moderately sophisticated companies have too many metrics. The best have fewer, simpler metrics and share them widely. I may be biased, but the best book I've seen on marketing metrics is Marketing in the Bottom Line by my colleague Tim Ambler. Tim trained as an accountant before he saw the light and became a top marketer at IDV, which may explain one of the best-known Smirnoff ads. In fact, this came from the agency, and he slightly objected to it, but be that as it may. For metrics on uh, specific campaigns, read some of the IPA marketing effectiveness cases. They tend to be for big consumer brands and usually include TV, but the evidence-based mindset is relevant to every brand, large or small, B2B or B2C. Finally, don't treat finance as the enemy. Work with them. They have a lot of power and are seen by the CEO as more cre credible than marketing. And they're not stupid. They know that some things are more measurable than others. Financial evaluation often involves counterfactuals, at least implicitly. For instance, the standard way to evaluate an investment decision is net present value. The basic concept couldn't be simpler. It's the difference in the value of company with versus without the investment. Both of these are based on counterfactuals. Neither scenario has happened yet. And both involve a lot of assumptions and uncertainty. Fortunately, to estimate the NPV, the only thing that matters is the difference between them, which gets rid of those assumptions and uncertainties that aren't related to the investment. The scenario without the investment is unlikely to be a continuation of the status quo. Especially for a strategic investment, the chances are that without it, the brand's market position will weaken over time because the competition won't stand still. As marketers, you can help flesh out this scenario for which your finance colleagues and the CEO will be somewhat surprised, but also extremely grateful. As I've discussed, brand valuation involves very similar principles. The brand value is the value of the company with versus without ownership of the trademark. Even ex post, evaluating a sales promotion always involves a counterfactual, which is what the brand's profit contribution would have been during the period of the promotion and afterwards to allow for purchase acceleration if you hadn't run it. To do this validly, you need a good way of modelling the counterfactual and of estimating the true incremental cost of the promotion, allowing for the disruption to production and the supply chain. That again means working with both finance and operations. Finally, this assumes that the promotion has no impact on brand equity. For a new brand, the impact may be positive by increasing awareness and trial. For an established brand, it's more likely to be negative. Marketers often feel that they're misunderstood and that the CEO and CFO are short-termists and don't get marketing. I think that's overstated. For instance, if you have a reasonably structured account planning process and you take them through your thinking, they'll probably get it. This is Stephen King's classic five steps framework developed at L JWT London in the 1960s. Question two, why are we here, is a key one that forces you to dig deeply into the data. Every successful IPA case study does this in some form. Question four is the creative bit, leading into the strategy or campaign to get you where you want to be. If possible, you should build the metrics in at that point to help you judge the results later when you address question five. Questions two and five are the ones most likely to be skipped or skimped because they're difficult 
but they're essential in a learning organisation. One reason why marketing is so interesting is its hybrid nature. Of course it's about creativity, but it also has to be disciplined. The CEO and CFO know that you're creative, but you need to show them that you're also disciplined. The best way to do that is to develop shared understanding, language and metrics with finance. This is more about attitude and behaviour than specific techniques. Finally, organisation, the CEO's third perspective. I'll briefly discuss, discuss why the marketing concept, which everyone understands and agrees with, has proved so hard to implement. I'll then give you a simple framework for putting it into practice, and I'll say a bit about the role of marketing. There are lots of reasons why the marketing concept has proved so hard to implement. Thinking about other people's problems as opposed to one's own is somewhat against human nature, especially for some people. It can be hard to know what customers want, especially for radical innovations that take them well beyond what they're used to. There's relentless time pressure, which makes it hard to get things right, and relentless cost pressure, which makes it hard to maintain a high-quality customer experience. There's the obsession with USPs, gimmicks, fads and fashions that tend to make products and services more complicated than most customers want. That's what we addressed in Simply Better. Relatedly, it's always easier to add features and benefits than to eliminate them. Finally, even if you have valid, actionable customer insights, they'll achieve nothing unless they reach the decision makers and are acted on. There are lots of behavioural and organisational reasons why this may not happen. It's this last aspect, organisational context and process, that Sean and I explored, explored, explored in our follow-up book to Sim Simply Better. The full title is Beyond the Familiar, Long-Term Growth Through Customer Focus and Innovation. Beyond the Familiar has done okay, but not as well as Simply Better, despite the fact that if companies really apply the suggestions, they're almost bound to increase their performance. I think we made a mistake assuming people would realise that they weren't actually doing what we say. It's mostly common sense, but most companies aren't actually doing it anything like as energetically and systematically as they could. Anyway, you can judge for yourselves how well your companies are doing the things we suggest. The framework is simple. You need to start with a relevant customer promise, communicated both to the market and across the company. Next, ensure that this promise is reliably delivered to build trust. Keep continuously improving it while still keeping it relevant and reliably delivering it. From time to time, you need to go further, innovating beyond what's familiar to you, the industry, and the customers. Finally, support all this with an open organisation in which ideas, information, and insights, especially unwelcome ones, flow freely. The challenge is to make the customer promise both relevant and affordable while still making money. In other words, meeting both the customer's and the company's needs. That's hard to do well. Don't make it even harder by obsessing about how much your customer promise differs from the competitors. This is the simply better point again. If you meet customers' needs better than anyone else, you'll build a strong brand like Toyota, even if it's less well differentiated than Volvo. The first two boxes in the framework, customer promise and trust, are the foundation of brand value, what we call the art of brand building. Every brand is unique, but every valuable brand has three things in common within its target market. Brand awareness, if no one knows your brand, you don't have one. Perceived relevance, if it's not relevant, it has no value to customers and therefore to the company. And trust, if customers don't believe you'll deliver what you promise, they won't buy your brand. You need all three which is why I've multiplied them. If one of them is missing, it doesn't matter how big the other two are. In today's political and business climate, the value of trust should be obvious, and I won't labour it. The last BBG event was about the excellent AIM research on consumer trust in brands. Read it if you haven't already done so. You can't buy trust. It has to be earned by keeping your promises and not letting people down. You certainly can't build it by telling people to trust you. If a salesperson says, trust me, your reaction is the exact opposite. 
What you can do is measure how well the customer promise is being delivered using something like the Net Promoter Score. Many of you will already know the NPS and may already be using it. I'm a fan, although it is controversial. For those that don't know it, it measures responses to the question, how likely is it that you'd recommend the company or brand to a friend or colleague? It uses a 10-point scale. Crucially, those responding 0 through 6 are labelled detractors, the 7s and 8s are ignored, and only those scoring 9 or 10 are seen as promoters. The net promoter score is simply the percentage of promoters minus the percentage of detractors. Many market researchers hate the NPS. They say it wastes information, that it's a single number with no diagnostic value because it says nothing about what's driving customer satisfaction and dissatisfaction, and that it has no special predictive value as it doesn't forecast organic growth any better than the traditional customer satisfaction scale. All of which is correct, but missing the point, which is to help improve customer experience especially by ensuring that the brand promise is reliably delivered. Because NPS is a single number, it provides a simple common metric that everyone can understand. In practice, the numbers range from roughly minus 10 to about plus 50. In pure perception terms, um, this has more impact um, than the variation you get from a typical five-point customer satisfaction scale. Similarly, promoter and detractor are wonderfully emotive terms. To uh, improve customer experience, which is, which is ultimately what we're trying to do, we're not just doing this for fun, you need to engage everyone, and you need to do that emotionally as well as rationally. And NPS, I think, is very good at doing that. That's not to say that market researchers are completely wrong. The technical criticisms uh, are completely right, um, and NPS doesn't have diagnostic value. It tells you that you have a problem and where you have a problem. It doesn't tell you what or why. Think of it as a flashing light or a cattle prod to get your attention. You then need to follow it up with diagnostic data and root cause analysis to find and fix whatever's driving the problem. To do that, you'll also need good costings and you'll probably need to work with operations, HR and IT as well as finance to find the best solution. In the 1980s, there was a thing called Japanese management, some of you may recall. It was steeped in oriental wisdom and uh, access uh, to the secrets of the universe in general. Then in the 1990s, Japan got stuck. The magic went to Silicon Valley and everyone forgot about Japanese management. Of course, both the Japan fad and the subsequent reaction were overdone. Continuous improvement Kaizen to us oldies, has been out of fashion for 25 years. It's due for a comeback. In reality, every valuable brand is supported by relentless incremental improvement. P&G is a past master at this, and the case we used in the book to illustrate it is Tide in the US. Tide was a technical breakthrough when it launched in 1946. But what's really impressive is the way it's maintained its market leadership and premium pricing over almost seven decades. This sustained success has been driven by relentless incremental innovation, both performance improvements and brand extensions, based on rigorous use of research uh, to ensure continuing relevance and with consistent brand support. Perhaps the most controversial part of Beyond the Familiar is what we say about radical innovation. This is a complex and nuanced area, but in summary, we recommend so-called adjacent innovation. That is, beyond your and your customers' current comfort zones, but still exploiting your existing sources of competitive advantage. Like our enthusiasm for continuous improvement, our suspicion of so-called blue sky or blue ocean radical innovation is currently rather unfashionable. The trouble is that innovation has become so value-laden Animal Farm had the one-dimensional four legs good, two legs bad. Innovation rhetoric is a bit more sophisticated because it has two dimensions. Radical good, incremental bad, and pioneer good, follower bad. In reality, attempts at radical innovation to create a new to the world category fail, almost always, because the level of demand never materializes on a sufficient scale. 
sometimes exacerbated by the difficulty of getting the technology to work. But even when there is a viable market, the pioneer usually ends up flat on his face with arrows in his back. Most markets are dominated by a fast follower who learned from the pioneer's mistakes, invested heavily, executed well, and built a market lead during the crucial early growth years. That's why we recommend adjacent innovation. Genuine breakthrough innovation seems to us too much like taking the shareholders' money to the casino. Fantastic if you win, but the odds are stacked heavily against you. Because this is also value-laden, companies like to represent their innovations, even to themselves, as more radical and pioneering than they really are, which adds to the general confusion about this. I mentioned Apple before as a simply better company. It's also rightly famous for its successful disruptive innovation. But Apple has never successfully pioneered a completely new product category, unless your definition of category is pretty narrow. But it's brilliant at entering new markets with products that are much better and easier to use than the pioneers' ones. Uh, it's also outstanding at incremental innovation, hence this quote from Steve Jobs 11 months before he died. It was this relentless incremental innovation that was able to beat our competitors. Okay? In other words, the iPad comes out and the second one comes out 11 months later, just about when the competition's caught up again and again. Underpinning the rest of the framework is an open organisation. The dirty truth in all organisations, including yours, is that everyone lies a bit to their boss, hiding bad news and not speaking up when they disagree with the boss's views. The boss always underestimates the extent to which that's happening, despite doing exactly the same <coughs> to his or her own boss. That's one reason why metrics are so important, to ensure that top management isn't getting too rosy-tinted a picture of customers' actual experience. <clears throat> Obviously, customer metrics like NPS are part of this, but employee met metrics such as staff satisfaction and 360-degree data are also important to see how open the culture is to new ideas and challenges. Sean and I wrote a little piece about this in Harvard Business Review a few years back, which started up with this made-up example. Why is Janet leaving? She's been unhappy for months. Why didn't she tell me? She tried. Uh, we all think our door is always open and people bring us, okay? No, okay? They're hiding bad news from you and you do just the same. Even the chairman does it to the, to the investors. This is from a US study on large service businesses. Out of 500 uh, dissatisfied customers, only one complains directly to the vice president responsible, which is still two levels below the CEO. Hence this famous quote from Jack Welsh, CEO of GE. Now, you may think it's a bit ironic for Neutron Jack to be talking in this touchy-feely way about creating an atmosphere where people aren't afraid to speak up. But the point is still valid, even though he didn't live by it himself. The exemplar for not listening to unwelcome messages was old General Motors. Drucker's original research was conducted at GM, commissioned by GM, and published in 1946. Everyone else thought his portrayal of GM was highly positive, but because he suggested some possible improvements, they regarded it in... Drucker's own words, as an attack on the company as hostile as any mounted by the left. And this is 1946, when even in America, you know, the left was the left kind of thing. You know, they had real socialists in 1946. Not many, but they did. 60, so hold on to that date, 1946. 61 years later, when we were researching the book, I spoke to Wally Olins, who told me this. So very high marks for consistency. Now, GM was so powerful in the 40s and 50s, it took the management and unions half a century to destroy it. But they did eventually succeed, and not listening to market signals was a key part of their success. Having an open culture is also crucial within a management team. This is from a study of Silicon Valley companies in the 1990s, looking at how the top teams in the best companies managed to express disagreements openly but without falling out. 
The first point is especially relevant to marketers. Factual current market data, especially customer insights, are a powerful weapon for getting heard and lead to better decision making. Take the time to explore multiple options. Work hard to create common goals using your brand vision and the threat of competitors eating your lunch. Use humour to defuse the inevitable tensions and ensure that you have a balanced power structure rather than either autocracy or they say for fair chaos. The last point is also important despite the ghastly academic label managed by consensus with qualification. People don't like autocratic bosses who don't listen, but they also don't like weak bosses who can't make their minds up and let the discussion go on and on or rely on artificial deadlines. They like strong bosses who genuinely listen and then if no consensus emerges, make the decision and explain why. The evidence is that if you do that, even those who argued the opposite view will throw their energy into implementing the decision. So that's the beyond the familiar framework for turning the marketing concept into reality. If you're already doing it, bully for you. If not, just do it. What's the role of marketing in all this? You need to do everything you can to ensure that the customer promise is relevant, the target customers are aware of the brand and see its promise as relevant, everyone in the business knows the brand promise and what the company stands for, incremental innovation and cost reduction maximise the relevance and perceived value for money of the evolving offer, innovation beyond the familiar meets real needs, and finally, management decisions are as far as possible supported by current factual data on customers and competitors. The challenge is that apart from point two, none of these is directly controlled by marketing. This has implications for marketing leaders. This is the focus of my next book on marketing leadership. The first author is Thomas Barter, an ex-McKinsey partner now working exclusively on marketing leadership. Briefly, we argue that the pressure to try and keep up with the ever more complex and fast-changing world of functional marketing means that marketers find it harder than ever to develop leadership skills to complement their technical marketing skills. But our research suggests that leadership skills are even more important than technical skills as a drive of marketing's, marketers' business impact and their career success. In response, we suggest that you should aim to do three things. First, mobilise your boss and your boss's boss by working on big issues that matter to the company. Secondly, mobilise your non-marketing colleagues, especially by walking the halls. I've emphasised finance today because it's so important to CEOs, but you and your team also need to build your network with operations, HR, IT, and in many companies, sales and R&D. Finally, you need to mobilise your team. Aim to be a leader of leaders so that you can delegate more of the technical decisions to them and to their teams, and spend more of your time understanding the perspectives and priorities of top management and non-marketing colleagues. One implication of this worldview is that who you recruit becomes a big issue. Of course you need people with the right technical marketing skills. I don't want to understate how hard this is, especially in areas like data analytics where everyone's chasing the same people. But you also need people who will be good team players within marketing and good brand ambassadors and collaborators beyond marketing. And you need to work with operations and HR to ensure that they're recruiting people, especially frontline people, who get the brand and want customers to have a good experience. First Direct was the UK's first modern customer-focused retail bank. It started as a telephone bank in 1989. For its call centre, it didn't recruit many retail banking people. Instead, it especially recruited teachers and nurses. In other words, it recruited people people and taught them banking, route one. Because route two, recruit bankers and then try and make them customer focus, works less well. With route one, you recruit people who, because of who they are, want customers to have a good experience. Of course, you need to train them in retail banking, and you also need good IT systems so that the screen in front of them deals with as many of the issues as possible, and you need good first-level supervisors. But the basic point is 
try and get the firm to hire frontline staff who are naturally customer focused. The lawyers among you have this issue in spades. It's easy to recruit those with the best legal knowledge, they're the ones with the best law degrees, but you also want people who will be great at handling clients, and that's harder to predict. Finally, what should you take away from all this? On strategy and ex execution, aim to help the company maximise the overlap between customer needs and its own needs. Work on things that matter to the customer and help the company to do the same. That means basics first. Make sure the kitchen gets delivered on time and the phone gets answered. The subtitle of Simply Better is about delivering what matters most to customers. Work on things that matter to the company, especially the CEO and CFO. That means you need to understand what those things are. Work with colleagues across the business. In most companies, they're the ones who will mainly determine the short-term success and long-term value of the brand. On finance, aim to maximise short-term performance and brand equity. Work with your finance colleagues to find an agreed set of metrics that work for your business. Make sure that you and your team understand basic financial concepts and measures, including why it's often helpful to think through the counterfactuals. Aim for an evidence-based mindset. As Ed Deming is alleged to have said, in God we trust, all others must bring data. CEOs, and especially CFOs, have the same preference. On organisation, here are five questions for you to try at home, matching the five boxes in the Beyond Familiar framework. You should also try and get the top team to answer if they really want a customer-focused company. First, can your middle managers accurately describe your customer promise? Can every member of your top team, including the finance person, the HR person, and so on, head of legal, list the top three things that most erode trust among your existing customers? Third, is your brand really the best option for customers, and will it still be next month and next year? Have you acted on any novel insights or ideas in the last year which led to a significant innovation beyond the familiar? And finally, have your frontline staff asked you any uncomfortable questions or suggested any important improvements over the last three months? And finally, a clarion call from leadership coach Marshall Goldsmith. Concentrate on what you can change, and that may be more than you think. Thank you very much.